The comm center received a mayday call from a 25-foot bay liner with six people on board saying that the all the occupants on board were suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. Two to 300 yards north of Hope Island, uh, three of them are incapacitated due to carbon monoxide. The operator is starting to feel the effects. Seatel's on route, so is the Good Samaritan. Uh, as soon as we start getting a little bit closer to it, you go down below and get it set up with the uh, rebreather mask. Before we got on scene, two commercial salvage boats, a safe sea boat and a sea tow boat, arrived on scene along with a Warwick Harbor Master. So, looks like the cause of the incident is they had their bimini top draped over the stern. Yeah, the bimini top's not, it's not on properly. I don't know if it's because of the incident they opened it up and ripped it off to uh, ventilate better or what, but I, I think it's that's the way they had it and just it allowed, it's an inboard outboard from the looks of it, and uh, just allowed the uh, exhaust to flow right up in. The sea tow boat Medevac, which is a medical evacuation, two of the occupants on board rushed them to shore so they could get em emergency help, EMS to the hospital. On this bay, the way it is, there's so many people on the bay that we can't be as close as just about everybody else is. This, today's incident was 30 minutes away from the station, so that was half an hour that they would have had to wait for us to arrive on scene if other people hadn't showed up first. Safe seed towed the just towed the boat to Warwick Cove Marina, or Warwick Cove at Angel Beach Marina. And that's where we, we escorted them all the way in. There was a total of two kids on the Harbor Master's boat. And, like, and uh, the wife was already transferred medevac by somebody else earlier before we got up. And it's it's good. It's It's always good to have other people nearby to have them assist. Even though we're not first responders, we're helping to coordinate some sort of rescue, and if, if it's over the radio, then, I mean, at least they're getting assistance. It doesn't have to be by our hand. All right, thanks a lot. Have a good day. That's the real meat and potatoes. That's what I just signed up for. It's the search and rescue. I don't want to say anything gets routine, because nothing is routine. It's always different. But, you know, once the case is over, you, as soon as the case folder is closed, you're pretty much closing it in your head, too. You just move on to whatever's next. Well, we're a 110 foot uh, patrol boat for the Coast Guard. Uh, primarily, we're a search and rescue asset. Uh, we'll go out there and, and pick up uh, anyone in distress, but. Uh, when we're not doing that, we're a, a law enforcement and a homeland security platform. Uh, specifically up here in New England, we concentrate on uh, fisheries regulation and uh, enforce uh, the fisheries laws put out by Congress. We're getting ready to head out on a fisheries patrol tomorrow, but we also have Hurricane Isabella on its way up, so uh, I'll expect probably a search and rescue case to come up. Uh, there's also going to be an element of homeland security in there. We'll be patrolling Boston Harbor, uh, looking for uh, any suspicious activity and uh, you know all the while our you know our main reason for going out in the first place was uh, to do a fisheries patrol. So we're going to be hanging out in this general area today um, and then what we'll do is once once we have an idea where we're going to go we'll go to the radar and check and see uh, check and see who's out here and, and how many ships and, and we'll look for a large concentration of them and then just uh, drive up on them and, and start querying them asking them who they are, where they are, where they're from, what they have on board, how long they've been fishing, when they expect to go back into port, last time they were boarded, uh, if there were any violations on that boarding, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And usually from that, we'll get enough information to decide whether we want to board them or not. Commander, good morning, Captain. Uh, are you the master of the vessel? 
Come on in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Roger, Cap, can I get your uh, name and date of birth? Then, Salarmina, it's uh, C A O R M I N A. Roger, and uh, how many people do you have on board? What's your target species? Two people, two people. Uh, multi species. Roger, Captain. Uh, when was the last time you were boarded by the Coast Guard at sea? And uh, if so, by what unit? Yep, wait a minute. Uh, uh, was this uh, Roger Cap, I uh, thank you for the information. Uh, hope you have a good trip. Uh, we'll be in the area. Yeah, thank you very much, Cap. Have a nice day. Yeah, Roger Cap, thank you for The fishing industry is, um, is, is highly regulated. Um, maybe a better word would be to say that it's, it's very complex in nature, that the regulations are extremely complex and, and dynamic and that they change a lot. He just landed a set about a few minutes ago, right before we got here. So he just deployed his nets again. So you won't get to, you won't get to check his nets, but you will get to check his catch. Um, and the last boarding that was done on him was done by us back in May. Um, he's got three guys on board, and, uh, and and that's about it. I think he's head. I think he said he was heading in at four, right? Yeah, so he'll probably try and make one or two more sets. Sure. Today. All right. It's you two and who else? Gunny and MK3 Mars. Okay. All right. So uh, he said he's ready for you to come alongside, and it's your choice which side you go along. Okay. We're all set then. Janiah and Joseph. Janiah and Joseph. When I deploy on board a, a fishing boat or a recreational boat or a high interest vessel, a container ship, depending on the size of the vessel, I take a certain number of qualified boarding team members with me. I want to make sure that at any time I would be able to control the situation. With the training we have, we don't consider ourselves in danger. We consider ourselves very well trained. We carry each one of us on our law enforcement belt a nine millimeter Beretta. We have an expandable baton. We have pepper spray. And we also have experience using several defense tactics should a crew member um, become violent or enraged with, with whatever we're doing. Well, we usually like to have more people on board than they have people on board. Uh, they have uh, three guys on board, the master and two crew, so we figured we'd put uh, four guys on, a four-man team, so that uh, the boarding officer and the assistant boarding officer can, can check all the administrative stuff in the bridge, in the pilot house, and then the, uh, the two boarding team members can, can uh, do the initial safety inspection and, and start checking the fish hold. We'll make sure that that um, everything checks out. Similarly to a, a police officer uh, pulling a member over on the side of the road, we check the fish holds. We want to make sure that whatever the master is permitted for, we compare his permits to his catch on board in, in the fish holds, the lazarette, and determine whether or not the fish he has on board is, is legal or not according to his permit. This ship's out of Gloucester, and uh, we boarded her back in May, May 10th. Um, it was actually before I was on board. It was uh, about a month before I showed up, but uh, they boarded her, and uh, apparently she was she was dragging inside the closed area for ground fish, um, and the the master was actually asleep at the wheel. <laughs> uh, he he's. Uh, no longer the master of the ship, but uh, they uh, they wound up sighting her and, and seizing her catch, and uh, that's uh, wound up being a pretty also a pretty hefty fine on them as well. So uh, we came across them today, 
Um, they weren't necessarily doing anything suspicious, but they're heading into, Bo or into Gloucester. They've got some, they got a decent amount of catch on board. They've been out for a day so far, and uh, so we figured we'd put a team on and check them out. Well, it's it's tough, you know. You've only got a, a finite number of assets out here to, to um, keep up with hundreds of fishing boats out of out of uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. But um, you know, you just you just go out here and you patrol the areas and, and uh, you see what you can see. Usually, you can get a pretty good sense uh, whether the guys. Or, or dirty or not, and um, you know, Eric haven't done hundreds of these over the course of the last year, two years. Um, he gets an idea as to whether uh, it, it requires further investigation or uh, just to finish up with the routine business and, and head on his way. And it looks like in this case, um, he said everything checked out and uh, the violations that we had noted last time have all been cleared up. So. Uh, Looks like with their new master, they've turned things around and, uh, for the better. I like to think of it as the uh, as the cop on the beat. You know, it's uh, people feel a little bit safer when they see the policeman in the neighborhood, and uh, in that sense, I think that we're providing some uh, feeling of security to to mariners and to people living living by the water when they see us out there. Um, you know, even beyond the realm of homeland security or, or, uh, or law enforcement. Uh, I know that uh, many mariners feel safer when they take their boat out for the weekend and they see a Coast Guard boat somewhere around because they know that if they do get into trouble, there'll be somebody on scene to, to respond quickly. I, I believe in, in the Coast Guard. I, I believe what we're doing. You know, I, I can say that, that when we make patrols to New York, when we, when we see downtown uh, the downtown area when we see the void left by the two twin towers you know there there are there are scars everywhere during a patrol that just remind us how how important our job is and and that hits home a lot and then uh, here are, you know now I'm the commanding officer of the ship which uh, you know I, I sit there sometimes and pinch myself and and, and think you know I'm, I'm 26 years old and I have this incredible amount of responsibility and authority and and I just I can't believe it it's uh, it's it's kind of awesome at, at sometimes to think about what I'm what I'm responsible for. You know, 18 lives, five million dollar ship, um, and then also responsible to the the public and, and the mariners to you know ensure their safety and and also uh, the the security of the eastern seacoast. I think just about every time that I pull into an out of port and I'm standing up on the open bridge, um, that that really comes across. Okay, a mission uh, this morning is the New York City Maritime Homeland Security Patrol, or PCWCSWA5 <laughs> Zulu 7. They change the name of it every, anyway. We're in New York City. The weather is fogged in from here pretty much to just shy of New York City, but it's supposed to slowly burn off, and by 10 o'clock it's supposed to be actually really nice um, between here and there. So we're going to go on instruments, get on top of this stuff, and head down to LaGuardia. We'll start our patrol at LaGuardia. Uh, we'll do the East River, Harlem River, we'll go by Yankee Stadium, and then go down the Hudson, uh, down Statue of Liberty, Port of Newark, back into New York Harbor, up the East River, and then uh, if it's cleared up, we'll continue Long Island Sound back here, and we have to check uh, New Bridgeport, New Haven, and Millstone Nuclear Power Plant, and Groton, and then we'll come back here. It should take us about four and a half hours, that's what typical nice and thorough New York City patrol takes in my recent experience. This particular area of responsibility, 1st Coast Guard District, basically New England, from just south of New York City to the Canadian border. We're looking for places and ships and things in and around the the major ports in New England. Coastal facilities could be anything from uh, uh, refineries alongside a river, alongside a, a harbor, 
uh, ferry terminals, cruise ship terminals, uh, cargo ship terminals, and any other associated uh, facilities near the water. Well, a standard crew for a patrol like that is going to be a, a flight mechanic and a rescue swimmer. On a patrol, there are extra sets of eyes in the back. Uh, we're often busy up front flying the airplane, so they're looking at, you know, looking for fishing vessels, looking for security violations in a port. My job in the back, or my role in the back, is to uh, basically just man the, the radios, or keep, keep a radio guard. That way the pilot can uh, focus on just flying and the co-pilot can uh, uh, navigate for the pilot and uh, double check him and they can just worry about flying the plane. In the helicopter you can get, uh, you can safely get relatively close to things, um, which is nice for sightseeing, it's also nice for security missions and also fisheries uh, flights because we can get close to look at a boat's name, to look closely at a, a ferry terminal, um, to check the, the water for signs of uh, you know, scuba divers or whatever the issue might be. Um, it's nice to get down and actually see stuff up close. Well, there's of course going to be some element of danger because you are flying at a low altitude. Um, one thing about that makes a helicopter, in my opinion, more safe than a fixed-wing aircraft, especially a, a jet or some kind of fast-moving aircraft, is that at the speeds that we normally fly at in the helicopter, we're going slow enough that we can maneuver the aircraft pretty pretty easily to avoid whatever's, whatever we don't see until the last second. Definitely, we have uh, increased our awareness in our patrols of what we call maybe the high interest areas along the ports of New England since 9-1-1. We've always had a, a major law enforcement role in the maritime environment. We still do fisheries. We've added to that with the, the Homeland Security flights since 9-11. SARS stands for search and rescue. That's just one of the um, many missions we have. It's our probably our biggest responsibility, but uh, because of Homeland Defense and everything now, we're, we're stepping up and doing uh, a, lot more, a lot more patrols. And uh, we're, we're basically watching out a lot more now. And we're also in the process of manning our aircraft now with, with guns as well to uh, cover our small boat crews doing, doing boardings on different vessels and stuff. Does that make a big difference that you guys are doing these security patrols? Sounds like you do a lot of them. Does you think that makes a big difference with the security of the country? I really don't know. I hope it does. Um, we've increased our, our flights. Um, in addition to our fisheries missions, we're doing these security missions. Um, we haven't had a major attack since 9-11, so you know, that's really the only thing I can, I can say. But I think the, the higher-ups in the Department of Homeland Security would maybe have a better analysis of that, you know, for that question. It doesn't just take an expensive plane, and it just does, doesn't just take a couple of ace pilots and a rescue swimmer. Uh, it takes a... Uh, it just takes a lot of maintenance hours with the aircraft. It takes a lot of uh, a lot of training hours with each person, and there's a lot of money that goes into all that stuff. So, if if someone were to figure out, you know, how much it costs, <laughs> you know, how much money we put into doing training, into doing maintenance, into, into equipment and everything per SAR case we do, or per uh, law enforcement mission we do, or uh, environmental mission we do. Um, it'd probably be a pretty big number, but it's worth every penny. Today we boarded a 600-foot tank ship off the coast of Rhode Island here. We asked for the uh, master's consent to search the vessel. We try to keep the waters here safe of drugs, contraband, stowaways, and anything else you can think of that would uh, disrupt uh, the way we live. They're going on board to, obviously there's marine safety inspection, make sure the vessel's safe to transit into port, and that's part of their boarding when they go on there. It takes them a few hours to go through everything, and then they get back off the boat and the boat's allowed to transit its way the rest of the way into Narragansett Bay. Six boarding team members, we interviewed the master, we swept the engine room, main deck, all common spaces. Most of our vessels are arriving are foreign, foreign vessels and uh, we get a good number a week and uh, we do at least one a week and we, uh, 
we target them based on uh, based on we have uh, we have targeting uh, criteria that we use. It could be uh, could be the crew makeup, could be the last port of call, could be the cargo itself, could be intelligence that we've received. We have a uh, we have a lot of intelligence sources that we use, a lot of other agencies in the government and uh, our own our own investigative service in the Coast Guard. Sometimes we'll know if uh, we have a a trouble spot among the crew through intelligence that we receive. Boat remains on scene just to aid the, the what we refer to as the boarding team that was on the boat. In case for some reason they had to get off or someone got hurt, they're there ready to respond for it. Instead of leaving them alone by themselves just on this big ship out, out in the water. So their main job is there's basically in support of the people that are on the boat. Already on deck, guys. I think it's pretty interesting. You know, a lot of times nine, ten o'clock rolls around. We've done one of these, and, uh, and uh, we're just uh, we're finishing finishing up with what we do. And uh, a lot of people just waking up, going to work, and uh, yeah, we've done a lot more early in the morning before some you know more than some people do in a whole day. I think they all enjoy the job immensely because it's such it, they can see. The job that they do has a has a benefit. It has a goal, it, um, and they get to go out and do it every day. They know what they're doing. They know what they're in support of. And a lot of times when they do these things, they see the end result. Um, pulling someone out of the water or saving someone is an end result that they see that lasts for a lifetime. There's no feeling like that. The same thing as if if they were to stop someone before something was to happen, um, is the same exact thing. So I mean, they see the end result of their training and of their mission. Hey, look back there and you can see that ship as it goes by. What's your, uh, what's your feeling as you see it go by? Well, uh, from what we've seen on it, I can, uh, I can see her comfort comfortably say it's safe. It's, uh, it's a safe vessel, the crew's good, and uh, the way I see it, it poses no threat. We tend buoys. We make sure that the buoys um, are winking and blinking. Uh, they're lighting up. They've got uh, this. The sun is charging them, so we got to make sure the solar panels are, are all working and uh, charging the batteries so that they uh, get the longest possible life that they could get. There you go. He's out of cage a little bit more. Spin it around. Ease it out. Hold the cage. All right. Can you get it now, boat? Um, the first thing that happens, I remember one of my chiefs uh, telling me, the, the one thing that happens after there's a tanker wreck or something like that, they check the buoys to make sure that they're on station and, and nothing else was wrong. And me going out there every day and, and tending, tending buoys and making sure that those channels are open so those mariners can see their way into port and out of port uh, safely, that's, that's awesome. Ready on the key. We uh, bring them on board. Um, first of all, pull them across the pocket. Give me some slack, dude. All right, on the count of three, you're gonna pull tight. Ready? One, two, three. Beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. Oh, no. Sorry. And then we work the electronic side of them. We somebody working on the electronic side of the house, and then um, another group of people will be working on the uh, mechanical or chain and. We're gonna change out the chain if we have to, because that chain moves around and wears away. The ocean wears away at it, so they're going to um, make sure that it's not gonna snap free of itself. Yeah, when you first get here, like it doesn't matter who you are. When you first get here, it takes a while to um, build up, you know, the strength. You think you know, right out of boot camp, you know, you're, you're strong and everything like that, but this is like a whole different physical aspect to it. get lazy about anything. You want to be aware of what's going on at all times and just making sure that you and everybody around you is in a safe area and kind of knows what they're doing. 
if a buoy swings, you could get pinned into the wrong wrong spot into a, a rock. We call it a rock and a hard and hard place. Basically, you could get pinned up against something. You want to be aware of what's going on. You don't want to straddle live chain because it can run taut. Also, um, just all those lines. You don't want to get fouled on those lines. Get your leg wrapped around anything because if that buoy does swing, you you're tending a line and that line's wrapped around your foot. You're gonna go with it either way. Okay, this is what you're gonna do. As it comes down, you're gonna pull. When I have to go and I have to unmouse it, give me a little bit of slack, yeah, because last time you were pulling so tight I couldn't get the mouse off. And that's why I said, no, it's alright. The people that you work with, you learn to trust. We're very we're very close um, knit because my life relies on the, the guy next to me. And whether he's new, um, that doesn't matter. He, he, I need to teach him so he knows what he's doing because his, his doing what he's doing, uh, my life depends on. Well, our primary mission um, was uh, aids to navigation. And uh, since uh, the 9-11 uh, incidents in New York, uh, that's kind of changed. Our primary mission pretty much uh, rests between the AIDS and Navigation Mission, Maritime Homeland Defense, and uh, Search and Rescue. Well, before 9-11, uh, we pretty much spent 60, 65 percent of our time doing AIDS and Navigation work between uh, Cape Cod and down the northern Jersey coast. And I, and I would say since 9-11, it's probably dropped about 35 percent. And uh, with, with the rest of that being focused on Maritime Homeland Defense and Search and Rescue. Uh, you know, being a multi-mission flat platform, we have the opportunity to do two or three things in a day and, and to shift. Uh, although we can only do one thing at a time, we can work eight ton in the morning and, uh, you know, slugging the chain around on deck and moving buoys. And then by afternoon, uh, we clean up and we could be doing a security patrol. Uh, and then by evening hours, uh, maybe we're at anchor trying to get a break and all of a sudden a SAR case comes up. So we'll weigh anchor and go out on the SAR case. So it's one of the great things. And it's also one of the reasons why we have to train a lot in multi-missions. You know, the Coast Guard, uh, when I came in many years ago, started out as a humanitarian service, and, and it's still that way today. Obviously, we've added uh, different things, and, you know, just in the last 18 months, you know, more security, more awareness of what's going on around us and stuff. And I think the fact that it's many different things at many different times of the day or the week, it becomes very satisfying for me. You learn to like it. It's a, it's a, it's definitely a love-hate relationship to, to sum it all up into, into one thing. Um, when you're working buoys, you hate it. It might be nasty out. Um, you know, you may be tired that day. Um, and when you're not working buoys, it's it's weird how it grows on you. Uh, when you're not working them, when you're in the yards or you're doing something else, you want to be doing it because you're you're humping that chain. You're 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 working, and at the end of the day, you got that satisfaction. Um, that yeah, I worked. Yeah, my muscles ache. And when you're not doing it, you don't, you don't, you don't. You, you get a satisfaction doing whatever law enforcement or, or homeland security mission or anything that you're doing there. Um, you get that satisfaction, um, but that that physical satisfaction, and, and and you know that you've worked x amount of buoys that day, and and everything's gonna be everything's gonna be all set wherever you're at. It is not uh, glorious, and, and we'll call it sexy in the search of, you know, in the case of a big rescue case or, you know, flying airplanes, you know, flying an F-14. It, it's not glorious in that sense. It is dirty work. It's hard work. It's long hours. And, uh, it's very gratifying work. It's very satisfying work. Uh, they are serving their country in this capacity. Chief that comes to be hanging out in the yard on